The 1980s and 1990s were transformative decades for the technology industry, marked by rapid advancements in computing power, the rise of personal computers, and the emergence of software giants. This period birthed the beginning of what we've come to know as the information age, an age where the amount of information began growing exponentially, facilitated by the proliferation of personal computers. This presented quite a serious problem, because up until the information age, humanity had created information systems that were made to work with small amounts of information, information that if it grew at all, grew linearly at a very slow pace. All of a sudden, with the emergence of the information age, information started to grow exponentially. Where a couple of papers would be the new daily edition of a typical office, now entire rooms of information were being created in a world which still stored information physically in alphabetized filing cabinets and other rudimentary storage techniques. It was painfully clear that contemporary database management systems would not suffice for the new age. This problem spawned the advent of the Relational Database Management System, a powerful new way of managing data for the information age. It was so revolutionary that it spawned one of the most intense battles within the technology industry that saw industry giants like IBM be pitted against relatively new upstarts, all in an aim to take control and dominate the database market. One of the contenders in the database market was an upstart called Oracle. It eventually emerged as the overwhelming victor of the database wars. Not because it was the best, but because it had the most ruthless and misleading business practices out of everyone else. This is the story of the database wars. How Larry Ellison ruthlessly led Oracle to crush its competitors and ultimately win the database wars. Our story begins in 1970 with the biggest computer company of the time, IBM, with one of its employees by the name Edgar F. Codd. While working at IBM, he had a front row seat to the emergence of the information age and saw the sheer scale of data and information that IBM computers were processing. He spent most of the 60s working out theories of data management, which culminated in a research paper titled A Relational Model of Data for large shared data banks. It introduced the idea of organizing data into tables that could be linked by common fields, making data retrieval more efficient and flexible. Codd's relational model was a significant departure from the hierarchical and network database models that were prevalent at the time. To his disappointment, the paper didn't get the reception he had hoped for. IBM refused to implement the relational model to preserve revenue coming from its existing hierarchical database products. However, Cod bypassed IBM and showed IBM customers the potential of implementing the relational database model, and they in turn pressured IBM to build a relational database product. IBM gave in to the pressure and ended up building a relational database product, but they hired a team of engineers completely unfamiliar with Cod's ideas, which resulted in a product that was far from what Cod had originally envisioned. Despite this, it still resulted in a database technology that was better than the existing database technologies of the time. The result was System R. It introduced SQL, a new language for querying and managing data, which would become the industry standard. However, despite its pioneering work, IBM was slow to recognize the commercial potential of relational databases and was hesitant to fully commit to the new technology. In 1983, IBM finally released DB2, its first commercial relational database management system product, which was based on the System R prototype. While DB2 was was technically advanced and enjoyed some success. It was a little too late for IBM to dominate the relational database market as other competitors had already been on the market for years. During this period in the early 80s, IBM was also entangled in the intense personal computer war and took a cautious approach to the relational database market, opting to focus on its existing mainframe business and its new entrance in the personal computer market. This limited its ability to capitalize on the growing demand for relational databases, leaving room for more agile competitors to enter the market. One person who saw the potential of relational databases before IBM did was Larry Allison. Larry Ellison, born in New York City on August 17, 1944, was born to a single mother 
who had to give him up for adoption after an incident where the young Allison became very ill and his biological mother felt she wasn't capable enough to take care of her child. She made the difficult decision to send Allison into the care of his aunt and uncle who would eventually adopt him. This early separation from his biological mother deeply affected Ellison's sense of identity and belonging. The emotional scars of being given up would form the foundation of his ruthless business attitude in the future. Ellison later described his adoptive father, Lewis, as a harsh and critical man who constantly belittled him and doubted his potential. On the other hand, his adoptive mother, Lillian, offered unconditional love and support, balancing the negativity he received from his adoptive father. The emotional turbulence of his childhood had a profound effect on Allison's personality. I have a great fear of failure, he once said. I was constantly told by my father that I was good for nothing. Larry Allison was an excellent student and after graduating from high school, he enrolled at the University of Illinois in 1962, majoring in physics. However, tragedy struck in Allison's sophomore year when his adoptive mother, Lillian, passed away. Overwhelmed with her grief and unable to cope with his academic responsibilities, he dropped out of the University of Illinois without taking his final exams and he returned home to Chicago to reevaluate his future. After spending some time in Chicago, Ellison enrolled at the University of Chicago hoping to continue his education. However, he soon realized that formal education was not suited to his temperament and learning style. He dropped out after only one semester. So in 1966, at the age of 22, after dropping out for the second time, Allison made the life-changing decision to move to California. With little money and no clear direction, he arrived in Berkeley, California. Initially, Allison worked a series of odd jobs to make ends meet. However, it wasn't long before he found his way into the burgeoning technology sector. The late 1960s and early 1970s were a period of rapid technological advancement. It was in this environment that Ellison's interest in programming began to take shape. With no formal training in computer science, Ellison taught himself how to code. One of Ellison's early jobs in the technology field was at Ampex Corporation, a company known for its work in electronics and data storage. While working at Ampex, Ellison was exposed to some of the most advanced computing technologies it was here that Ellison first encountered the concept of relational databases. He had come across Edgar Codd's paper. He became fascinated with applying Codd's ideas in the real world. So he set his sights on building a commercial database management program based on Codd's ideas. Ellison, the two times dropout, suddenly found himself at the forefront of the technological revolution with a groundbreaking idea. Ellison, along with his colleagues, Bob Miner and Ed Oates founded Software Development Laboratories. In 1979, STL released Oracle V2, opting to call its first version, version 2, to make it appear as if it was a more stable build and a more established product. The software was a game changer, offering companies a more efficient and flexible way to manage data. Oracle's success was rapid and the company quickly grew into a leader in the database industry. In 1982, SDL officially changed its name to Oracle Corporation, reflecting the centrality of the Oracle database product to the company's identity. Oracle used its first mover advantage to quickly dominate the database market, but as the database wars began heating up, new relational database management companies aiming to dethrone Oracle entered the battle. Ingress was a company that emerged from a research project at the University of California, Berkeley. Two of the computer scientists involved in the Ingress project, Michael Stonebreaker and Eugene Wong, decided to commercialize the university research project in 1980 when they founded Ingress Corporation. Ingress was technically advanced and featured innovations such as ACID, compliance, which ensured data integrity and support for concurrent access to data making it an attractive option for businesses needing to manage large volumes of data. Oracle years into its release was not fully ACID compliant, while Ingress launched with full ACID compliance. The product quickly gained a reputation for being more technically robust 
than many of its competitors. Oracle in its early stages lacked some of the sophisticated features of Ingress. Oracle V2 was notorious for being buggy and incomplete compared to Ingress and many early adopters complained about data integrity issues. Yet despite this, Oracle still won the database wars. How? Well, simply put, Larry Ellison was very aggressive. Ellison built a highly aggressive sales force that was focused on closing deals quickly at any cost. Oracle salespeople were known for their relentless pursuit of customers and the ability to sell the product's vision even when the software was still lacking in functionality. One of Oracle's most famous sales tactics was its promise of future functionality. Oracle would often promise features that didn't exist yet or that were still in development and many businesses bought into this vision. By the time the promised features were delivered, customers were already locked into Oracle's ecosystem. Oracle also used aggressive pricing strategies to win over customers. In some cases, Oracle would offer deep discounts or special terms to undercut competitors like Ingress. This allowed Oracle to win contracts even when its product was technically inferior. Larry Ellison was also a master at forming strategic partnerships and alliances which helped Oracle gain credibility and expand its customer base. One of Oracle's most important early alliances was the US government, specifically the CIA. Oracle's first major contract was to build a relational database for the CIA, a project that not only provided critical funding for Oracle, but also gave the company a level of legitimacy that few startups could match. In contrast, while Ingress had strong academic roots and a technically superior product, it struggled to secure the kind of marquee clients that Oracle was landing. Allison also used unscrupulous business tactics. Allison and his sales team would often spread rumors about the stability and viability of competing products like Ingress, sowing doubt in the minds of potential customers. This helped Oracle position itself as the safer choice, even when its product was actually inferior. Despite its superiority, Ingress continued to lose market share as Oracle grew rapidly. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, Ingress was a shadow of its former self. In contrast, Oracle was on a trajectory of exponential growth, expanding its offerings and solidifying its position as the dominant player in the database industry. Sybase was another significant player in the database wars. Founded in 1984, the company quickly gained a foothold in the market with its innovative approach to client-server computing. This architecture allowed for greater scalability and flexibility, making Sybase a popular choice for businesses with large distributed computing environments. It provided formidable competition to the relational database management products of Oracle. In 1988, Sybase entered into a partnership with Microsoft to co-develop a version of SQL Server for the OS2 operating system. However, the partnership with Microsoft ultimately proved to be a double-edged sword. While it gave Sybase access to a larger market and helped drive sales in the short term, it also set the stage for Microsoft to become a direct competitor. In 1993, the two companies ended their partnership and Microsoft began developing its own version of SQL Server for the Windows NT platform. Sybase struggled to maintain the competitive edge in the face of increasing competition from both Oracle and Microsoft. By the late 1990s, Sybase market share had declined significantly and the company was forced to refocus its efforts on niche markets. This left Oracle as the main player in the relational database management software market. While Oracle was solidifying its position as the dominant force in the enterprise relational database management system market during the 1980s and 1990s, another competitor was quietly emerging in the background, MySQL. This new database was vastly different from established players like Oracle and IBM's DB2, both in terms of its target audience and business model. The rise of MySQL introduced a new challenge for Oracle, especially in the emerging market of open source software. Unlike traditional enterprise-focused databases like Oracle, MySQL was designed to be lightweight, fast, and most importantly, open source. As an open source database, MySQL was free for users to download, modify, 
identify and use as they saw fit. A stark contrast to the proprietary and expensive relational database management system solutions offered by companies like Oracle. Initially, MySQL's market was developers building web applications, small businesses and startups that couldn't afford the high cost of enterprise database software. Despite being open source, MySQL was commercialized through a dual licensing structure. While it was free for open source use, companies that wanted to use MySQL in proprietary applications could purchase commercial licenses. This model helped MySQL generate revenue while maintaining a large engaged community of developers who contributed to its ongoing development and improvement. The rise of MySQL represented a new challenge for Oracle. Oracle's relational database management system was considered the gold standard for large-scale enterprise databases, offering advanced features like scalability, high availability, and security, which were crucial for mission-critical applications. However, it was known for being complex to manage and expensive to license, making it inaccessible to smaller businesses and developers. MySQL, on the other hand, was simple, fast, and free, which made it attractive to a growing base of developers. Although MySQL lacked many of the advanced features that Oracle offered, it was sufficient for many web applications, and its open source nature allowed developers to tailor it to their needs. MySQL's lightweight nature also made it well suited for the cloud computing revolution that was beginning to take shape in the early 2000s. The success of MySQL underscored a fundamental shift in the database market. The rise of the internet and cloud computing, along with the increasing importance of web applications, meant that traditional enterprise databases like Oracle were no longer the only game in town. While Oracle continued to dominate in industries like finance, healthcare, and government, where large-scale database management and advanced features were essential, MySQL was rapidly becoming the de facto choice for web developers and startups. Oracle saw this as a massive threat because in time, these small startups would emerge as big competitors that used MySQL instead of Oracle. While Oracle maintained its dominant position in the present, it saw that MySQL had the potential to be a threat to its future. So it began a plot to regain full control of the entire relational database market. In 2008, the company behind MySQL was acquired by Sun Microsystems for approximately $1 billion. However, the real twist in MySQL story came two years later when Oracle, out of nowhere, shocked the tech industry and acquired Sun Microsystems in a $7.4 billion deal in 2010. Many in the open source community feared that Oracle, known for its proprietary software and aggressive business tactics, would either kill off MySQL or stifle its development to protect its own relational database management business. MySQL had been seen as a disruptor to Oracle's dominance, especially as it had gained traction among large web companies and cloud providers. But with the acquisition of Sun Microsystems, Larry Ellison had complete control of the two most significant relational database management software products on the market and had successfully built a formidable empire. He led his organization to victory in the database wars and then took control of the emerging open source threat and emerged at the helm of one of the world's largest software companies. All this from a database product that was initially inferior to its competitors, but through sheer ruthlessness and cunning strategy, Oracle won the database wars, and as a result, Larry Ellison stands as one of the wealthiest men in the world today. Thank you for watching.